Good morning, and um, we say this all the time, and those of you who are here frequently or even periodically have heard it, it's like a mantra, and we really mean it, and that is welcome home to General Seminary. This is our spiritual and our worship home. This is the place we go home to think deep thoughts and then go out into the world to put them into action. And so you are part of that today. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Thank you for joining us. Um, so there are a few things to say. One, I'm, uh, I'm going to give a, a, a somewhat non-conventional introduction of the Archbishop. But before that, I have one housekeeping announcement. And that is, uh, folks, you can, you can see there we all have these devices. And I've been in many churches, and when I was a parish priest, I was tempted to put into the church bulletin, um, please silence your cell phones and pagers. Of course, nobody has a pager anymore, but, um, so, but, um, but in my parish, I did it differently, and I'm, I'm gonna suggest that we do that here today. And that is, I want you to get out your cell phone, and I want you to turn it on, and I want you to turn the ringer to the highest setting, <laughs> And if you get a phone call, I want you to stand up in the middle of this, and I want you to answer it, tell the person that you are at General Seminary listening to Rowan Williams, and you should be jealous and hang up, okay? Fair enough? Is that fair enough? All right. So the rules are a little different here. Rowan Williams is so known to all of us, not just Anglicans, not Episcopalians, but around the world, that an introduction seems rather uh, pedantic but I'd like to say three either little or unknown things about the Archbishop. The first is that 45 years ago, as Mr. Rowan Williams, a very promising graduate student, he made his first trip outside of the UK to deliver a lecture, and that was here at General Seminary. It was on T.S. Eliot and the Four Quartets. I would say that my predecessors, seeing talent, had a pretty good record. Things have turned out okay for him. The next thing, so far, so far, the next thing is, um, is three, is the second little fact is that uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams has been here as a layperson, as a priest, as a bishop, and now as an archbishop. And that fullness of ministry is an absolutely delightful thing to celebrate that uh, I said to him uh, earlier in the year when we met last year, I said, well, now, are you sure you weren't here as a deacon? He said, well, aren't we always deacons? So um, I think we can trust that this is the fullness of ministry that has come to us. The third thing is a rather personal fact, and that is he has two children, and one is a, is a boy, Pip, who I met, oh, 15 years ago when he was about eight years old, running up and down the hall of Lambeth Palace. I was there for a Compass Rose event. And, um, and so when we were having tea about six months ago, I said, how is Pip? How's the boy that ran back and forth? He said, oh, interesting. Pip is, uh, Pip is going to be an actor. I said, oh, let me tell you my story of my own children. Our daughter Maddie wanted to be an actor, and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a display of the worst parenting of all, one night at dinner in high school, she, she said she was going to major in, in drama. And I just said, in front of her mother and other sisters, I said, oh, what kind of restaurant do you want to work in? <laughs> I relayed the story to the archbishop, and he looked a little sheepish and said, we just had that conversation with Pip. <laughs> so I only bring this up because this room, sir, is filled with New Yorkers who have connections. So those of you who have drama connections and would like to earn a few points with the former archbishop of Canterbury, you will find him at lunch without a Jew the most reverend Dr. Rowan Williams for the Paddock Lectures 45 years of being Christian at General Seminary. Thank you so much, Mr. Dean, for that very, very generous and pointed introduction and welcome. And I look forward very much to conversations over lunch, as promised. This was indeed the location of my first visit to New York and the United States, and a very important moment for me. A moment when I first had some experience of teaching, a very spirited, intelligent class here, a period over here when I had opportunity of developing some of my own research in ways I shouldn't otherwise have been able to do. And of course, the beginning of 
what's already been described, a long association with this seminary, this chapel, and a good many of the people gathered here this morning. So it's a very special privilege for me to be back here and to be able to share with you some reflections on a lifetime in theology. I was given to understand that it might be acceptable if I simply, for these lectures, thought a little bit about theology as it's evolved during my own lifetime, during my own career as a theologian. Now, I have made solemn promises in front of witnesses that I will never write an autobiography. And I make those promises again in front of all of you. What you're going to listen to, or at least what I'm going to say, and you may or may not listen to it, <laughs> is something more in the nature of an attempt to pay some debts, to acknowledge gifts and influences in my own evolution as a theologian, and some attempts to sketch a changing intellectual and spiritual world in theology in the last 45 or 50 years. In the course of this reflection, I'm bound to mention from time to time things that I have attempted to write, to say, to do as a theologian, but don't panic, I'm not going to do a, a book by book review of my career and all the rest of that. I hope that the effect of reflecting with you in this way will be, among other things, simply to give a picture of how theology in general, the reflective life of Christ's church, moves and grows in a period of perhaps unprecedented social and cultural change in the last half century or so. And although I've been given as a title 45 years of being Christian, I'm going to stretch it a bit and take you back into the late 60s to begin with. You may not have noticed it, but in December last year, three very significant anniversaries were marked. The 50th anniversary of three deaths, which took place within a few days. Thomas Merton, Karl Barth, and Austin Farrer. And as I thought about the task of reflecting on theology in the last few decades, I thought those three names, especially for Anglicans of a certain generation, will sum up a very great deal of the intellectual and spiritual world that we've lived in. And speaking for myself, I would say that those were the three names which helped to keep me sane in the early days of trying to learn theology. They did so in spectacularly different ways. But each of those three figures, an American Roman Catholic Trappist, a Swiss Reformed pastor, and an Anglican Oxford Don, each of those three figures represented a kind of light and air let in to what at the time felt a rather small and rather anxious theological world. The climate of theology, when I first began studying it in the 1960s, was not expansive. I think it's fair to say. Academic theology in the United Kingdom was heavily dominated by two disciplines. One was the philosophy of religion, conceived in a way which was strongly shaped by English-speaking philosophy of that period, a philosophy that was very suspicious of large metaphysical claims, 
a, the a philosophy that was very interested in the principle of verification, which tended to be materialist and skeptical. So that religious philosophers were from the word go, rather on the back foot. And the other discipline that dominated within the theological world was New Testament study. The historical criticism of the New Testament, especially as it had evolved in Germany in the middle of the last century. This was an approach to scripture which was itself strongly shaped by another kind of philosophy this time by the existentialist philosophy of continental Europe, especially the thought of Heidegger in Germany. The giant figure in this world was Rudolf Bultmann. And the general approach to the text of Christian scripture was an approach skeptical about the historical basis of scriptural narrative, interested in distilling a kind of timeless message from the New Testament, determined to rethink what was regarded as a mythological frame of reference in which the New Testament was written, and finally, deeply individualist in its understanding of faith. The New Testament was an act of proclamation which called us to authenticity. It called us to take responsibility, each one of us, for our lives before the mystery proclaimed in the cross of Jesus. It was a very powerful reworking of many of the ideas of classical Lutheranism, but a system which brought into that both the philosophical revolutions of 20th century Germany and the legacy of what was then over 100 years of critical scholarship on the evolution of New Testament texts. When you look back, this was a rather odd and unusual mixture of intellectual worlds to live in. On the one hand, the very exhilarating and dramatic world of continental philosophy and the demand for authenticity. On the other hand, the extremely skeptical and minimal approach of old style English language philosophy. But I would say looking back that it was between those two poles that a great deal of theological education was happening at the time. And one of the effects of this was that it was not at all easy to see exactly what theology conceived in these ways had to do with the church. On the one hand, you had a quite abstract, intellectually sophisticated, but narrowly focused set of philosophical reflections. On the other hand, you had a theology which confronted the unstable and anxious individual with the transforming summons of the proclamation of the cross. Not trivial, not empty, but how exactly do you relate it to the practice of a Christian community and the actual culture, a word I'll come back to, of worship. There were those in the Church of England and indeed in churches here in the United States who were able to make some kind of accommodation, who produced a version of what I suppose would, would have been common a hundred years ago in Catholic modernist circles. You were able to keep up the ritual and custom of the church in a fairly old-fashioned way, 
but you didn't really allow the radical philosophies and scholarly cultures you might be practicing elsewhere to impact on that reality. I can remember a very distinguished New Testament scholar of extremely radical views, regularly and devoutly ministering an extremely traditional Anglo-Catholic parish in Cambridge. But what I'm saying is that at that period, exactly how theology might still be understood as a genuine intellectual discipline rooted in and serving the life of a worshipping and serving community is very hard to see. And that's where perhaps you can understand why a student of that era might regard the three figures who died in December 1968 as significant. Karl Barth was emphatically somebody for whom reflection on Christian doctrine, on creed and scripture, was the basis of a revolutionary resistance to one of the worst tyrannies of the 20th century. Bart was somebody who believed intensely that the task of theology was to celebrate and witness to the act of God, the sovereign act of God. And that a theology which failed to point us to the sovereign act of God, summoning God's people to absorb and respond to God's word, a theology which failed in that did not deserve the name. Thomas Merton was somebody for whom the lifelong reflection on how the practice of prayer changed the mind and heart stood at the source of all theology. And Merton, once again, was somebody whose exposure to and absorption in the deep history of monastic spirituality allowed him, like Bart, to stand up and resist in a whole range of ways in the 1960s. It involved him early on in the support of the civil rights movement. It involved him in writing some extraordinarily prescient and penetrating essays on race in the United States, and eventually it involved him in the support of the anti-war movement of the 60s. But more than that, it was his own deep rootedness in his own spiritual tradition, which allowed him once again, in a way deeply in advance of many of his contemporaries, to be engaging critically and creatively with the non-Christian religious world. It took him not only into extensive ecumenical discussion, it took him into the exchange of wisdom with the Dalai Lama and other Buddhist teachers. It took him on his last journey to Asia into the very heart of a spiritual world that many of his fellow Christians would then have regarded as impossibly remote. It even gave him a few evenings sharing beers with Joan Byers. <laughs> One of the more enviable aspects, I think, of Merton's monastic life. <laughs> Austin Farrer led a highly conventional life as an Anglican don in Oxford, hardly putting his nose outside the university, it seems. And yet, in his own philosophy and New Testament scholarship, he brought his readers back to a sense of the prior action of God, as radical and comprehensive as Karl Barth's vision, to a sacramental theology pervading his reading of scripture, to a sense of the creed as something to be inhabited more than simply recited. 
And that's why figures like that were, for some of us in the late 60s, something of a lifeline. Helping us to understand not only a connectedness between theological activity and the life of the church, but between theological activity and a vision of the human world in its richness, which allowed discernment, protest, and hope in the political context. And for those of us who were at the time, like Merton, involved with varieties of witness and protest around the injustices of the world of that day, this was no small thing. So there were already, as you might say, cracks in the surface of the theology that we were being taught. And there were great figures around at the time who helped some of us find a bit of a way out. Again, I'd mention three names from that era who were, for me, liberating presences. I'd begun quite early on to read some of the work of Eric Maskell. Like Austin Farrer, a conservative Anglo-Catholic, and someone whose career had led him not very far outside the traditional academic and clerical world. Maskell, in later life, became a pillar of the very conservative wing of Anglo-Catholicism in Britain. But he was also a theologian who was able to weave together in his work the philosophical, the doctrinal, the sacramental, and the spiritual. He was able to show how what one might want to say philosophically about the nature of the world's creator would release ways of talking about the work of Christ in the incarnation how that released vision of the work of Christ in the Incarnation would give us a vision of the church that was worth committing to, and how that in turn made sense of a particular approach to the life of prayer and contemplation. Donald McKinnon, professor in the philosophy of religion at Cambridge, was the most immediate inspiration I had in those years. A man who wrote relatively little, whose teaching could be impenetrably difficult, whose personality was wildly eccentric, but whose perspective was extremely unusual, in that he was one of the very few senior academics in Cambridge at that time, who really understood something of the gravity of the cultural crisis of Europe in the 20th century, who understood, along with Karl Barth, why one needed to understand the church struggle in Germany in the 1930s if one was going to understand theology at all. Donald McKinnon, you could say, very briefly, was somebody who helped you see that in an age like ours, where dehumanizing power was becoming more and more widespread, you needed some very good reasons for resisting. And for him, those reasons for resisting had to do with the uniqueness of God's presence in Christ, and above all, had to do with the radical self-emptying of God in Christ, a self-emptying which the church ought to be mirroring and generally wasn't. Donald McKinnon was a fierce, not to say savage, critic of many aspects of the Church of England of his day. 
but he was somebody who criticized the church because he knew what the church needed to be. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he was not content with what he liked to call ecclesiological fundamentalism. That is, leave the church as it is and speculate freely when you're in the university. For him, the work of theology bore upon the life of the church and made it difficult. And if there's one thing that all of Donald's students would say with absolute conviction looking back, he knew how to make things difficult. <laughs> I'll come back to him in just a moment. But the third name I want to mention as influential in this period is a name probably better known then than now, and that is Thomas Torrance, the Scottish theologian, a great interpreter of Bart, but also a theologian fascinated by the ways in which theology as an intellectual inquiry mirrored many of the elements of other sorts of intellectual inquiry, including the sciences. He was somebody who was beginning to build intellectually serious bridges between the world of theology and the world of natural science. And his book on theological science, published, if I remember rightly, in my second year as an undergraduate, once again opened a door on a larger, tougher, but immensely more enriching world of reflection than much of what I'd been used to in my undergraduate studies. Thus far, what I've been trying to convey is a sense in those years, in the late 60s and early 70s, a sense of a rather small and rather anxious theological world being gradually but inexorably broken open by other sorts of question, other sorts of presence. And perhaps, for me personally, the discovery which brought all this together was a twofold discovery towards the end of my time as an undergraduate studying theology. I began to read seriously in Eastern Orthodox theology, having picked up Vladimir Olosky's The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church in my um, summer vacation in, I think it would be 1969 or 70. And there, what I read was quite a lot of the material, quite a lot of the subject matter that I was dealing with in the study of church history in the university, but reconceived, revitalized, as a world of understanding and imagining that was still fully inhabited. It transformed my study of the early church in my third year as a student, much to the dismay of my Cambridge supervisor. But what it brought home to me, and I said I'd come back to this particular word, what it brought home to me was the fact that theology belongs in a culture, a culture, a whole way of understanding the human world and its positioning in regard to its maker, a whole vision of what was possible for human beings, and a whole ensemble of practices and inherited wisdom which allowed one to grow, not only in the kind of understanding that allows you to write essays for your tutors, but that allows you to grow as a disciple and a child of God. And for me, that discovery of theology as a culture, theology as something in which the practice of the sacraments, the practice of prayer, the practice of public witness and struggle all belonged with the technicalities of the doctrinal exploration. That was the liberating reality. <laughs>
I found it in Losky. I found it also in my last year as an undergraduate student in a very different writer, that great eccentric, ambivalent figure, Charles Williams, a friend of C.S. Lewis. I read his little book, He Came Down from Heaven, at that time, and had once again the sense of being drawn into a culture, a whole way of being in the world shaped by belief in the incarnation. And other things fell into place around that. All of that is by way of rather general background to the discovery and exploration of the years that lay ahead. But I'd want to underline very specially that notion of what I've called theology as culture. Because having read Losky and Charles Williams, I began to realize what it was that was missing in some of the theology with which I had begun. I might describe it also as a sense of the dense texture of Christian language and practice. Reading some of the philosophy of religion from the 1950s and 60s, you could be forgiven for concluding that essentially religion was a matter of a certain number of rather cautious propositions. Practice did not feature very conspicuously. What it was actually like to say these things and believe them and what it was like to challenge one's own action and understanding in the light of them didn't come through terribly clearly. And that's why, as I say, I found somewhat to my surprise that aspects of a profoundly traditional approach to Christian doctrine were feeding a rather less traditional approach in myself and some of my friends to many of the social issues of the day. In my years as a graduate student, I was involved with one or two other people in the foundation of the Jubilee Group, a small and quite talkative network of Anglo-Catholics in the Church of England committed to a strongly left-wing agenda I discovered to my delight many years later that we had actually been um, under surveillance at one point. <laughs> um, extraordinary to think of. Uh, this little group of rather, uh, as a rather talkative clergy and lay people, about half a dozen of us who met every few months to discuss the relation of theology and politics. We were apparently regarded as a threat to national security in some quarters, <laughs> which is rather more flattering than anything else, I suppose, <laughs> but does suggest some of the ways in which some preoccupations about national security go in very odd directions <laughs> indeed. But I pass over that hastily. <laughs> the point is that for those of us involved in the early days of the Jubilee group, it made perfect sense to think that if the doctrine of the Incarnation was true, there were certain things true about human nature and human dignity, which were, to put it mildly, very badly served by many aspects of the society we lived in. And to put it no more strongly than that, that was where what I've called the dense texture of traditional life and practice actually began to have traction in the complexities of the 1970s. And that was also a period when the first translations of Latin American liberation theology were beginning to appear in the UK and indeed here. I found, as did others, that the theology of many, not all, but many 
of that early generation of liberation theologians, had unexpected resonance with things that we were learning from other sources. And that perhaps above all, the central insight had to do with where theology happened. The insight that theology happened where lives were transformed. That theology happened where people began to see there was more in the human world than various kinds of functionalist and often oppressive systems might allow. For some of us of that generation, the words of St. Irenaeus echoed frequently. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. And the true life of a human being is the vision of God. That still seems to me to be an unimprovable summary of what, in the fullest and best sense, an orthodox theology has to say. But by that time, I was working in more detail on the theology of Vladimir Lossky, whom I've mentioned, the Russian emigre thinker who spent nearly all his adult life in Paris as an academic, a specialist in medieval Western thought, but also probably one of the most creative Eastern Orthodox theologians of the last 500 years. I had the great good fortune of having a quantity of unpublished material by Lossky to work through, lectures he'd been giving at the end of his life. And in those lectures, he was developing and taking forward what's probably his most significant insight as a theologian. He argues in his work that the theology, particularly of the Greek fathers, represents a midpoint between two great distortions. We can misunderstand humanity as individualists. We can misunderstand humanity as collectivists. We can think that human society is just an uncomfortable bundling together of lots of individual interests that need a bit of negotiating and policing. But that the fundamental thing remains the individual's right and agenda. Or we can suppose that every individual's right and agenda must simply be sacrificed to a collective good. Between these extremes, says Lossky, is the Christian truth, which takes as basic not the individual, but the person. The person, says Lossky, who is always already in relation. The person who cannot exist without the other. The person who can't be abstracted from that involvement with others. But at the same time, the person who cannot be extinguished, silenced, or negated by some abstract collective. And that middle way is not easy to realize, but it is what the Christian doctrine of the person entails. And Lossky goes into great detail showing how that view of the person arises from certain perspectives on the person of Jesus Christ and how it arises from a full understanding of the nature of the church itself. He wrote groundbreaking essays on what he would call the Catholic consciousness. In other words, to be a Christian within the body of Christ was to have an awareness of yourself and others which was distinctive, not just to have a set of extra ideas about God or humanity but to have an awareness of self and other, a consciousness which was shaped by that deep awareness of mutuality, reciprocity. Lossky was a Russian Orthodox Christian, and so, of course, he thought that Russian Orthodoxy 
perfectly exemplified this balance in the Christian world, over against the rampant individualism of Protestants and the tyrannical collectivism of Roman Catholics. He had, let's say, a, an ever so slightly rosy view of the Russian Orthodox world, but what he offers us is a kind of diagnostic tool where we can see these equal and opposite distortions actually at work in pretty well every form of Christian society. And I, like others, have found this an extremely fruitful grid through which to view the risks of Christian life. It's not that there is any one body or one Christian tradition which perfectly incarnates this balance. But it's important to know where the extremes are and important to be able to recognize the ways in which individualism and collectivism constantly draw us towards over-hasty, over-simple solutions to our problems. So the further work on Losky that I was undertaking in the 70s began to fill out for me what this theological culture was all about. Began to show me a theological world in which the heart, the center, was a vision of the person. And through that, a vision also of the whole of reality as relational. For Losky and many others, this was, of course, summed up supremely in the doctrine of the Trinity. That's to say, the doctrine that the nature of God, the very being of God, is not that of some individual standing over against creation, but is itself a harmonic action which can never be thought or seen or in any way understood without reckoning with its inner harmonics, the diversity, interaction, mutual definition of those different elements of a creative, liberating, infinite agency. That's what reality ultimately is. If that's what infinite reality is, then finite reality, yours and mine, struggles to keep up and exemplify and reveal that mystery. Now, the insights that came from Losky are not unique to him. He gives them, I would say, a unique clarity and radicality. But he was somebody who was himself constantly in dialogue with some of the new Roman Catholic thinking in the middle of the 20th century the thinking that went into the Vatican Council eventually. And a figure like Henri de Lubac, the great French Jesuit, in his writings exemplifies something of the same vision. His own work, de Lubac's work on Catholicism, makes some very similar points about how the Christian growing into new life, into faith, is somebody growing into a new sense of belonging with the other. And it's a vision which takes us beyond many of the conventional standoffs between conservative and liberal approaches. It challenges both a static conservatism, in which the main thing is just keeping things going, it also challenges an easy and facile liberalism. Just let everyone's agenda flourish and we'll sort it out somehow. De Lubeck and Losky and a good many others are saying you have to dig deeper than that to discover what is most human in us. And you'll find that what is most human is our involvement with one another, already given before we even begin to speak or think. In the late 70s, 
One of my students in Cambridge was a young historian from Oxford by the name of John Milbank. And I had the unusual pleasure of watching one of my students, well, not unusual pleasure, the all too common pleasure of watching one of my students outstrip me in terms of intellectual depth, energy, and creativity. The very first beginnings of the movement that we now call radical orthodoxy were around in the late 70s. And they had a lot to do with this Losky de Lubac shaped interest in rethinking the human and claiming with confidence and energy that the Christian church, especially in its historic sacramental form, had something of fundamental importance to say to a fragmenting, rivalry-dominated, acquisitive, and short-term focused world. While I still have some areas of limited agreement with some of the proponents of radical orthodoxy, that seems to me to have been one of the great breakthroughs of theology in the last half century. And I felt privileged to be watching it evolve in people like John Milbank and his students in turn. Perhaps there's one more thing worth putting in at this point. I've mentioned Losky as an Orthodox theologian, de Lubac as a Roman Catholic theologian, but I also found in those years a great deal in our own Anglican legacy, driving in much the same direction. And the very formidable figure of John Neville Figgis of the Community of the Resurrection at Murfield, who died early in the 20th century, came into focus for myself and some others as somebody who was, as a philosopher of politics and of history, who was able to hold together some of these ideas in his own age and to set out a vision of the relation of church and state and also a vision of the nature of a healthy political society, which continued to provoke and inspire. Figgis believed that one of the great fallacies that the modern West kept on falling in love with was the notion that there was or should be one normative source of authority in society which would smooth out all differences and create a homogeneous social unit. No, says Figgis, human beings live in all kinds of communities. They have all sorts of deeply diverse allegiances. They have languages and customs, convictions and affiliations, which all have to be taken seriously in a healthy society. So far from a good society being one where people don't disagree, a good society is one in which disagreement becomes constructive and exciting for everyone. And the society that emerges is enriched by diversity and not paralyzed. Figgis believed that the church, again, should reflect in its own life something of that celebration of a positive and engaged diversity, and that it was no good trying to be either individualist or authoritarian in the church and then challenge society to reform. The church had to discover itself how to balance those competing claims. The church had to discover how to manage constructive diversity. So the role of theology in clarifying not only a doctrine of humanity in general, but a doctrine of the church as exemplifying and embodying a new humanity, that was something which, for me in the 70s, was coming into focus 
in engagement with all these figures and with many more. And as the 70s wore on and turned into the 80s, these were issues that took on some new edge and some new challenge, particularly as the feminist movement began to shake some of the foundations of traditional theology. And the first large theological questions about gender and same-sex relations also began to impinge very, very slowly and gradually on the mainstream world of theology. And I'd want to say that so far from that being, at the time, a standoff between a reformist and a traditionalist agenda in the church, many of the theologians who mattered most to me were people who were extremely hard to categorize as either traditionalist or liberal in that sense, because they were thinking out of central convictions about the new humanity in Christ. That's why a figure like Donald McKinnon was of such importance to many of us, a man for whom the orthodoxy of the Nicene Creed was axiomatic and formative of everything, and a man whose capacity to absorb fresh and difficult questioning from outside that tradition was almost unparalleled. But that consideration brings me, in the last part of what I want to say, to another aspect of the whole of this period, and I suppose of the whole of my own theological engagement in this period. I would say that perhaps the most significant theological impulse I had experienced before beginning my studies at Cambridge came from my school studies of English literature. I'd had the great good fortune in my school in Wales to be exposed to the metaphysical poets of the 17th century, to have to make a special study of Herbert and Dunn. I'd been exposed to the study of Shakespeare's King Lear in my last two years at school. I'd been encouraged by my teachers to make a close study of the poetry of Dylan Thomas, that uh, great local hero and local villain in Swansea, my hometown. And absorbing what these teachers had to say was to become a steady background for me in my study of theology. These were writers who engaged with questions of love and guilt, of death and doubt, and ecstasy and failure. These were writers for whom the human world was never a one-dimensional affair, and for whom the peace or wholeness that humanity might hope for could never simply be a matter of finding out what was right and doing it. Life would be a great deal simpler if we could work on that basis. Find out what's right and do it. But if you've had a few months reading King Lear and Thomas Hardy and Iris Murdoch, let alone Dostoevsky, you begin to wonder whether finding out what's right and doing it tells you very much useful about the nature of human life. You begin to see that in the human world, there are so many areas where it seems good action, in any simple way, is not available. Where you're choosing between compromising and hurtful alternatives, where you are never going to have the luxury of a clear conscience. 
One can get over romantic about this and over despairing. But there is a fundamental realism here in the life of the imagination as we read it in drama and poetry and fiction, a fundamental realism which says that one of the greatest lies we tell ourselves is that we can make a neat and satisfactory story about our lives. The discovery that we may not be able to make such a neat and satisfactory story is one of the most significant breakthroughs we ever make into maturity. We can distort even that. We can mythologize and romanticize our struggles. But good art, good imagination, simply tells us this is the world you inhabit. Don't suppose that you can make of yourself a finished, edifying product of consistent good decision. In other words, to be mature is to recognize your need. Your need of reconciliation, of mercy, of hope, and of fidelity from other human beings. And as I reflect on this, that word fidelity, I have to say, echoes more and more strongly for me. Is it not a fundamental fact about us as human beings that what we ask of one another and of God is as much as anything else, faithfulness, not going away? Isn't that the basis of so much of our prayer and our service and our, I suppose, our hope for transformation? but more of that perhaps on another occasion. The point is that if this is something of the scope of a vision of humanity you're bringing to bear, then you have, and it's something Donald McKinnon was very keen on, it's something which gives you a vantage point from which to look at various systems of ethics and theology and say, are they trying to make this easy? What if this attractive system is one you can only believe at the cost of denying certain things about yourself and your world? Can we not in some sense test our theologies according to how much they encourage us, encourage us to deny things? And perhaps again, going back to Karl Barth and Thomas Merton and others, part of the force of their witness is a sense of how little they turn away from complexity, how little they want to deny. And it's in that environment, in that context, that I suppose the writing and example of Dietrich Bonhoeffer became important to me. Bonhoeffer, who writes in his ethics that there are indeed circumstances where you will not be able, looking back, to say, I did a good thing, and where you will have to submit the outcome of your action to a mercy you cannot imagine. Bonhoeffer, who became involved against, in many ways, against his theological judgment in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer, who believed that because he had been involved in that compromised way, he should not serve as a pastor after the war. What struck me then and strikes me now about this extraordinary figure, surely one of the very greatest Christian minds and hearts of the 20th century, is that he does not want to deny or make anything easy, but neither does he, so to speak, wallow in his guilt. He doesn't attempt to say, well, these are very difficult circumstances, so the right thing to do, the good thing to do, is what 
most of my predecessors would have regarded as sin. And it's all right. No, Bonhoeffer says, it's not all right to plan anyone's assassination. Have you got a better idea? If we, after prayer and reflection, take this immense risk, this immense moral and spiritual and political risk, all we can do with weeping and groaning is hope that it will not make things worse. The courage, the honesty of that continues to move me. I make no judgment on whether one ought to plot assassinations. <laughs> Probably not. You know, I think the church is generally right on that. <laughs> but I can't imagine the constraint of a man living in the face of that massive, murderous tyranny. I can't imagine. What I can just imagine is the inner struggle of a man of profound integrity to maintain that integrity in such circumstances. And all of that sense of what, in shorthand, we call the tragic dimension to human life, that feeds in, I believe, to our assessment of the truthfulness or the honesty of different sorts of theology. It's certainly not that one has to have a tragic view of life or some such thing, but that a good theology ought to draw us away from that supreme idolatrous ideal of having a flawless story to tell about myself. It should acknowledge that conscious and unconscious failure Guilt, hurt, and all the rest of it are bound up with our human interaction. And that what we need is healing rather than just illumination. I can't realize for myself peace or absolution or release. But I pray with confidence and understand that the resource of God's creative grace is not exhausted by my compromise or my guilt. Thus Bonhoeffer and many others. And as I hinted earlier, many of the great novelists of the period, those who were themselves profoundly committed to one or another form of Christian understanding, Graham Greene, William Golding, and indeed Iris Murdoch, whom I've mentioned, each of them standing somewhat on the fringes of their religious institutions, and yet returning again and again to these questions of the risk of setting up an idol that I control and manage, a moral idol, each of them spelling out the ways in which, with the best intentions in the world, we step deeper into the mire of mutual hurt, mutual damage. And William Golding's phrase in one of his novels, human beings don't seem to be able to move without killing each other, was a dictum which I remembered many times in those years and still do. But that may explain why when I first came to this seminary, I lectured not on Vladimir Lossky, but on T.S. Eliot. And why in the years I was working on my doctoral thesis, I found that maintaining a sustained interest in writers like Eliot in the margins of my research was part of what kept me alive as a theological thinker. And the very last piece of that bit of the jigsaw, has I suppose to do with the discovery in those years of most particularly the Carmelite spirituality of St. John of the Cross. I'd begun to read a little bit of St. Teresa some years earlier, and indeed Therese of Lisieux, 
But I don't think it was until I was a graduate student that I began to read St. John of the Cross systematically and to realize something of the immense depth and hinterland within the Christian spiritual tradition of that suspicion of ease and comfort which St. John celebrates. It's easy to misunderstand St. John of the Cross, easy to focus on his analysis of the dark night of the spirit and to suppose that he's simply an explorer of the gloomier side of human experience. But John is putting before us the most radical challenge of all. What if we cannot receive the unimaginable joy that God purposes for each one of us unless every corner of our self-mythologizing and self-serving is cleansed? What if the whole of our construction of our selves, our image of ourselves, what if all of that has to come under judgment? Not because it's evil, but simply because God has more to give than we can initially absorb. And so it was that in those years I found the writings of John of the Cross and some of his disciples a kind of focus in my own prayer as well as my reflection for what I believed was coming, again, coming into some sort of clarity around the nature of the human person, the failures and ambiguities of the human person, and the glories of the human person. Realizing that St. John of the Cross's meditations on contemplation, its darkness and uncertainty, were at the very same time meditations on how we became richer, fuller, and more joyful than we could imagine. And how as we got rid of our self-serving myths and images, what was born in us was simply faith, hope, and love. And therefore, the contemplative vision and system of St. John of the Cross is by no means a recipe for a retreat into a world of inner purity, but a highly practical set of guidelines for growing towards one another as we grow towards God. The work of the great 20th century Benedictine spiritual writer John Chapman helped me in those years to see some of the practical application of the teaching of John of the Cross. But it was in that period that a lasting passion for the work of the Carmelite spiritual writers began in my own thoughts and my own prayers. And I suppose that all of that, which I've just described, was drawn together in my wildly overambitious first book, the Wound of Knowledge in 1979. Nobody at the age of 29 ought to write a book on the entire history of patristic and medieval spirituality. <laughs> and as I turn its pages now, I think with embarrassment of the teaching on which it was based. And yet, the challenge simply to engage with that particular succession of writers and to try to make a story of it it's not a waste of time, at least for me, never mind my unfortunate readers. But, as I've said, I don't intend to give you a review book by book <laughs> of the last 45 years. But in this first part of my reflections, I've simply wanted to put before you a moment in English-speaking theological history, especially in the UK, when something began to break open 
something which had been rather occluded, rather silenced in the world I've described of a very limited philosophy of religion and a very radical New Testament exegesis. Something which raised the question of what kind of personal and communal life is this theology about? And the way it came together for me, I suppose, was at some point realizing that theology would not be there were it not for lives being different. And that if theology was thinning out, becoming dull, spiritless, and limited, maybe that should make us think that our lives were not changing enough. And maybe, therefore, all of this stuff about theology, all of this metaphysics about the person, all of this complicated tradition about prayer and contemplation, all of these explorations in the world of literature, all of this comes back finally to the question of whether we're willing to be converted. Because theology happens because human beings are converted, turned around, and the world looks different. And I continue to thank God for those writers and presences and friends who in those years went on bearing witness to how the world might genuinely be different. The Farrars and the Barts and the Mertons. I dare say you'll have your own equivalents of those, but maybe in question and conversation we can explore some of the perspectives you have, if not on that era, on your own theological pilgrimage. And later on today, I'll have a little bit more to say about um, the odd thought that crossed my mind in later years. Thank you very much. And we do have some time, I think, for questions. What time is it now? Right. So we've got uh, maybe 20 minutes or so for any thoughts you'd like to share, criticisms you'd like to make, observations, questions, you know, whatever. Converting all this into the terms that make sense to the plumber or the policeman or indeed policewoman, I dare say. Um, the first thing is what you actually yourself want to embody in your relationship as a pastor with the police officer or the plumber. What messages are you giving to them about the depth of their humanity, the nature of their gift. It starts, therefore, not with lectures on theology. I, you know, I entirely realize that. Um, it starts with a theological living, your own pastoral capacity to take them seriously and allow them to feel they're at home. That's, you know, that's the first moment. Second aspect of that, I think, is what message does the experience of worship in your community convey? Does it convey a sense of duty to be performed or a sense of enrichment to be absorbed? Because none of this makes sense unless the liturgy we share declares God is infinitely worth loving and delighting in and God wills that that infinite love and delight enthuse and transfigure us. So th those are two little starting points, way ways in of, 
Oh, how long have we got? <laughs> the question is about um, Lossky's idea of the, the person as between the individual and the collective. How does that relate to the sense of the common humanity that Christ restores in the incarnation? That, yeah. What Lossky says is something like this. The eternal word of God, the second person of the Trinity, is not an individual any more than the Father or the Holy Spirit is an individual. So what comes into human life in the incarnation is not that an individual who lives in heaven now lives on earth, as an individual who once lived in California now lives in New Jersey. You know. Um, I, I make no judgment on the relative. <laughs> 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 um, what happens is that this utterly unique, unimaginable way of being God in relation to the Father and the Spirit, this utterly relational, eternal agent, becomes the principle of a human life. But that means that at the heart of Jesus of Nazareth, there's something much more than an individual humanity. There is a distinct divine freedom reaching out all the time to make relation. And what happens, therefore, as people are drawn into communion with Jesus, is that their own humanity is, as it were, broken open by that intense drawing of love so that a communion of an unprecedentedly deep kind happens. And that's how you can say humanity is restored in Jesus, because there's more than just the, the individual in the heart of Jesus. There is that divine, relational, communal, reciprocal reality, which is God the Word. Um, now then. Yeah, there's somebody over there. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much for your intriguing talk. I was really, you piqued my interest when you talked about the feminist movement shaking theological foundations. Would you say a little more, please, about feminist thinkers who've influenced your own theology? Mm. In the 70s and 80s, I suppose the, the main figures who were <clears throat> making an imprint in the UK would be US-based writers like Rosemary Ruther and Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza. And I can remember the, the excitement with which those books were received at the time. There were colleagues of mine like Sarah Coakley, who were beginning at that time to absorb that in a much deeper way and make their own adjustments in the UK. There were others in the UK, like Daphne Hampson, who were to go on to become post-Christian, deliberately and ex explicitly post-Christian writers. So that was beginning to impinge, partly <clears throat> in connection with struggles and controversies over the ordination of women, but partly in its own right. And issues around vocabulary and gender specificity in talking about God were being raised at the time. But for me, one of the most interesting writers of that era, somebody who's not sadly very well known at all, but had some influence in the UK in the 80s, a Roman Catholic woman by the name of Angela West. And she was somebody who was a very committed feminist in practice, in her uh, witness and her advocacy, <clears throat> who was very heavily involved also in the anti-nuclear movement at the time but who wanted to push back at what she thought of as <clears throat> an excessively simple feminist analysis, which, which just regarded femininity as essentially less violent than masculinity. Angela would have said, of course, in the society we're in, Masculinity is associated 99% of the time with violence. 
But let's be careful of essentializing, saying there's something that is just feminine, that is just masculine. What is it that women have to repent for, she asked, because it won't do just to say that you can sidestep that. So she wasn't particularly popular either with conventional Catholic <laughs> public or with feminist public, but her courage and originality had quite a lot of influence on many of us, especially helping us <clears throat> to see how very, very complex the relations of power were, which could be involved here, and how they ran in more than one direction. To go along with Angela, you'd have to accept the basic premise of a feminist critique, but you'd have any number of backwards and forwards challenges in the course of following it through. So I've, I found her a very challenging, very interesting interlocutor in those years. But Elizabeth Fiorenza, somebody, again, from whom I learned a great deal, and while I suspect the great book in memory of her looks now flawed as a historical analysis, it was an immensely courageous and imaginative attempt to retell a story in a way that liberated voices that had otherwise not been heard. <coughs> of the many uh, and varied figures you discussed, uh, two really stand out in my mind. One is T.S. Eliot. And the other one is uh, uh, Tom uh, uh, Thomas Merton. Both of them engaged themselves with uh, the Buddhists, not just at the theological, intellectual level, but at the contemplative yes. and the activist uh, levels. And after they parted, I don't see much uh, movement to continue and go beyond where they were, except for the German Jesuits. Mm -hmm. who work uh, outside of Germany, including Sofia University in Tokyo, Japan, for example. With your global vision and experience, where, if anywhere, uh, can we go uh, with uh, Eliot and uh, Merton's uh, contribution made half a century ago? Thank you very much indeed. It's an extremely good question. And I quite agree that in the last few decades, there hasn't been any obvious following through of some of that. There are um, small-scale localized dialogue groups which, which work at the Christian Buddhist frontier. There are more and more little groups where meditational practice is shared to some extent and teaching. And I can think of one that I've been a bit involved with in the UK. But there are two issues maybe here. One is, in terms of interfaith engagement, I'll say a bit more about this later today. In terms of the interfaith engagement, the challenge of Islam has filled the sky for many Christians at the expense of some other engagements. Second thing is, <clears throat> in many churches, sadly, there's been growing nervousness about shared practices of meditation. And I worry about that. I, I hear people from certain Christian backgrounds speaking as though meditation was something deeply unchristian, and as if we had nothing to learn from um, other religious traditions. That needs to be tackled and argued with, I would say, quite, quite a lot. Um, but. You know, for, for the record, I've, I found myself in the last mm, five years or so working um, increasingly with the Dalai Lama's foundation on some educational programs, looking at the question of how, for example, high school education might look if issues around meditation, empathy, universal compassion were fed into the way an educational community itself worked. So that's ongoing work, which we hope may bear fruit at some point. So it's not entirely 
not entirely dead, but I'll say a bit more about it later on today. Um, let's see. There's somebody over there and somebody here, and I think over there. Just keep waving your hand. Your Grace, I wonder if you might take a moment to uh, speak to the efforts of Carol Atia in addressing questions posed by 20th century theology uh, and the extent to which you know, his teachings comport with your own. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that was most interesting about the philosophy and theology of Pope John Paul II was the way in which he, again, has a very sophisticated, complex view of the person and his own indebtedness to certain philosophical traditions enabled him to develop in his work on, on the acting person, something not a million miles away from the model I've mentioned in relation to Lossky and, um, and de Lubac. So I'd say there's quite a lot of convergence there in, in that particular area, and many of the philosophical influences that were important for him in his early work, I would say were important for me also. Um, writers like Husserl and Merleau-Ponty from the phenomenological school who fill out that background. So more could be said, but there's, yes, you rightly recognize a convergence there, I think. Uh, somebody here, and is there somebody on this side? Yes. You mentioned um, earlier in the beginning, very briefly, about authenticity, uh, being authentic, mm -hmm. and how the question that I had um, sort of kind of sparked a, a thought in me, because that's the word we use a lot, uh, probably without quite understanding what that really means, mm -hmm. but how does the, that fit into your vision mm -hmm. of theological culture, and is there a sort of particular kind of ethics of authenticity or moral theology of authenticity are com come out of that. Thank you. I mentioned it at the beginning because I think certainly in the 60s and 70s, the language of authenticity could be borrowed quite freely by people who perhaps didn't entirely see that it was about more than just being sincere. Um, and. A lot of what I've been saying might rightly be understood as challenging the idea that there is an, a given center of authenticity in me which I've just got to strip away the, the layers and get to. I think that's one of the great myths of our time. Authenticity, I would say, is much more the habit, the practice of responding from, from my center to what comes to me. That is not to be intimidated or held back by false expectations of me, not to be intimidated or held back by my own desire to succeed or impress, but to have a freedom to exercise what I am. But that what I am is not just an individual little something. It's, it's the life I have learned to live in communion, in fellowship with others. And the mistake I'm trying to nail, I suppose, is the idea that we all of us carry around this true self, like a little egg somewhere in here. Um, but no, my true self is the self I've learned to be with you and with others. And my integrity, therefore, is not burrowing down for the little egg. My integrity is having enough understanding of where I'm coming from, who I'm related to, what my hopes and horizons are, and the courage to act out of that. I've always said that the, the great slogan you've got to watch for is the one that appears in, um, in Peanuts so often. You know, how can I be wrong if I'm so sincere? Um, that, watch out for that one. <laughs> so, there's someone over there? Hello, Archbishop. I'm actually a convert to Russian Orthodoxy, so I very much appreciated your comments. Uh, 
my question then is for, for myself, becoming Orthodox was a moment of deep sacramental uh, conversion. And so I'm curious, because you're talking a lot about intellectual conversion, so I'm curious if there were moments in your young life where you felt a liturgical or sacramental mm. conversion. Thank you. Um, yes, I think I was, I was drawn into the Anglican Church, partly by a sense of the sacramental. Having grown up as a, a Welsh Presbyterian, um, I found as an, in my early teens that something quite different was opened up to me my first encounter with sacramental Anglican worship, and throughout my teenage years, found that that sacramental environment, not, um, you know, not an extravagantly ritualistic one, but a, a steady sacramental diet with profoundly intelligent teaching woven in around it, that was what brought me and held me in that, that context. Certainly my later um, encounters with Orthodox worship just intensified my sense that that was, you know, that was where it all landed. Dr. Williams, thank you for this morning, and we look forward to the next 30 years in about two, uh, two and a half hours. So we will join back here at 2.30, and until then, lunch is served in the refectory. There are, I believe, four different choices, and instead of trying to serve 350 people with plates in China's and buffet, there are clear boxes that you have to choose from. So find a seat wherever you can, and good luck, everyone.